my dear brother, my late dear brother, Randy Weston. And he and I came together uh, in 2000 uh, to discuss writing his memoirs, his autobiography, which is called African Rhythms. And if you know Randy Weston, you know that obviously I got a tremendous education, uh, not only on uh, the music and his generation of musicians, uh, but also most explicitly on Brooklyn and on the history of Brooklyn in terms of jazz and the arts. And then in, in, in 2010, uh, I had previously met uh, a woman by the name of Jennifer Scott, who was a cultural anthropologist who was working at Weeksville. And uh, she and I began talking. And in 2010, she developed uh, funding and a framework uh, for me to conduct a oral history project, specifically uh, interviewing artists and activists and presenters from central Brooklyn. And so she and I went about conducting these interviews and uh, it was a wonderful experience because I had an opportunity to get insights into things that I had only previously read about, had not, for, unfortunately, had not had the opportunity to experience like the East. I, I had an opportunity to interview G2 Weyusi, uh, the founder of the East. And I also interviewed as part of this project, Mensa Wali. And uh, Mensa was the person who was particularly responsible for booking the artists and for the menu of jazz presentations at the East. And the whole development of the East I found to be particularly fascinating because my sense of the East had previously been as this wonderful performance space, but I didn't know all the various facets of the East until, uh, until these brothers schooled me on the development of the East. And uh, in addition to the two of them, we interviewed a number of, 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 of very important people in Brooklyn uh, we interviewed a number of, of jazz masters like uh, Kenny Barron and uh, Harold Mayburn and Larry Ridley and uh, some very wonderful players, James Spaulding. In addition to that, um, in terms of those community activists who continue to bring jazz to Brooklyn, specifically to central Brooklyn, uh, it was my great pleasure to interview uh, Ahmed Abdullah, who I see on the screen. Uh, Ahmed Abdullah and uh, Roger Wareham and Viola Plummer about the whole aspect of Sister's Place. And uh, it's wonderful how Sister's Place kind of picked up the baton where the East left off and has continued to develop the, to bring the music to central Brooklyn in, in a very fine way. Ahmed Abdullah is the uh, music director there. And uh, I've always appreciated the menu and lineup of artists that perform at Sister's Place on a weekend to weekend basis. And, you know, Sister's Place, of course, was born out of community activism in Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, much like the East, Sister's Place is not just about performance, although performance is certainly a major aspect, but it's not just about performance because among other activities, including political action, uh, Sister's Place also had a green market uh, for the community in an area that uh, might not have had that kind of resource in abundance. So, you know, you know another, you know, just, just to give you a sense of some of the other people that we interviewed in the, in the process, another person we interviewed that I found very fascinating was uh, 
Fred Braithwaite, who is known in hip hop circles as Fab Five Freddy, a pioneer on the hip hop side in terms of bringing hip hop to television. He's the one that he's the one that 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 that, that brought hip hop to MTV, and 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 first brought it to television. And his story is very interesting because now now you say to yourself, well, I thought that this project was about jazz in central Brooklyn. But Fat Five Freddy's story is, is, is tied in the jazz in central Brooklyn because his godfather is Max Roach and uh, his father was a member of a, a black gentleman's chess club that Max Roach was a part of. And so he came up getting a lot of knowledge from people like Max Roach and Randy Weston and Jimmy Morton a photographer who was another person I interviewed as part of this project. And uh, that was another very fascinating interview. It, it, it was, there was all kinds of revelations to be had from this particular project and a number of very fascinating <coughs> people and very important people in the development of arts and culture in Brooklyn that were part of our oral history project. Great, thank you. Um, and I think that provides a segue to um, uh, Mr. Basir Macaulay. Um, um, I'm here. Um, I didn't know when, when I was going to go in terms of my, my visuals, but uh, let me just give a, a little bit of background. I moved to Brooklyn in 1969. That's the same year that the East opened. I was born and raised in the Bronx. And we have to understand that in the Bronx, there were all kinds of places where you could go ahead and experience the music. So places like the Boston Road Ballroom and the Savoy, the Bronx Savoy, which was on 149th Street. So uh, give you an idea, back sometime in the Absolutely. middle 60s, uh, Ilambe Brath and his brother Kwame, as part of uh, AJAS, the organization they founded, the African Jazz uh, Society, they had an event at which Sun Ra was playing. This is on the Boston Road Ballroom, right? Right, Boston Road Ballroom, <laughs> you know, right, right in the hood. Mm -hmm. So, to give you an idea in terms of the things that could happen in the hood, the first time I saw the Miles Davis Quintet, the one with Wayne Shorter, Tony Williams, Ron Carter, Herbie Hancock, was at the Blue Carnet on Nostrand Avenue in Brooklyn. And I also had an opportunity to see that same group at Count Basie's in Harlem. So there was this idea that you could have the best and the brightest musicians and you could have that right in the community. You didn't have to go downtown. You didn't have to go to any of the clubs. It was possible. So back in 1969, as a result of the struggle for community control, because you have to understand that many of the people who came together to create the East were originally teachers, administrators, and students who had been involved in the struggle for community control. This was uh, especially a struggle that took place in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, all right? The idea was that the community should have control of the educational system. But we found very early that it was going to be something that was not going to happen. The powers that be were not going to be going ahead and giving the control of the school system to the community. So at that particular point, G2AUC, uh, members of the African Teachers Association, the African American Students Association, they all decided that they were going to create their own thing. So what they did 
is they found a building, 10 Claver Place, which at the time they found it was something called Studio O. Now, Studio O was a club, and it was also kind of like an artist loft. So over the summer of 1969, after seeing that it was not going to be possible to have self-determination in the education system, G2 and these students came out, found a building, and began to renovate that building. That building became the East. Let me at this particular point go ahead and share my screen. Can you, can you uh, give me a uh, screen share, Abden? Yes, I can. Um... Well, you know, as, as we wait for that, um, I have to say, is that, as Willard said, that the idea that the East was just a place where music occurred is not so. That's not what that was. That we used to say that the East was a culture and educational center for people of African descent. And that's what was meant. But aside from that, we also have to include the political, because the political was a great aspect of that. Do we have screen share now? Yeah, I, I gave you. Um, okay. You're another host. All right. Let me go ahead and grab this. All right. Let me just do this right here. This is just a short piece of some of my photographs, uh, some of the artwork of Ron Warwell. So you can get a kind of taste of what the East was about.
Okay. You know, Basir, I have to ask you. Um, I, one of those photos was 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 M. Tume, right? That's correct. Young M. Tume. Uh, was it was was what the, the recordings that M. Tume made for Strata East, and then Pharaoh Sanders made live at the East. What other commercial recordings came out of those sets at the East? Well, you know, the interesting thing is is that. Um, the uh, uh, Al Cableland album, the uh, the album that M. Tume did, was recorded at the East. Right. Uh, Live at the East by Pharaoh was not recorded at the East. Is that right? <laughs> what they did is they took the crowd from the East and took them to a studio. Oh, okay. It's recorded there. It's actually a studio recording with uh, an East audience there. And you know, I'm I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned the blue coronet because I failed to mention that one of the people we interviewed during our oral history project was Dickie Habersham Bay. Yeah. Who was the proprietor mm -hmm. of the Blue Coronet and who had a lot of great stories. And I also failed to mention uh, the Central Brooklyn Jazz Coalition. Mm -hmm. I see Bob Myers' name on the oh, screen yeah. and I know that Bob is part of that. And Bob Myers was one of those who were, who were interviewed as part of this project as well. Okay, definitely, definitely. Now, when uh, music was started at the East, uh, it became uh, a way to actually go ahead and, and recruit people to join the organization. Uh, it was something in terms of the music, and we have to understand the function of the music. I mean, the music was something that many of us gravitated to, which was an instrument of struggle. It was not just, uh, you know, something that we went ahead and did and enjoyed. It's something that we did essentially to kind of shore us up as we went ahead and would do various forms of political work. And uh, many people who came to the East really understand that. I shared the Josh Tyson Furman uh, film. He did a short film with Plunky Nkabindi, who used to be the head of Juju. He was the head of a group called Juju. Right. And in his little short film, he talks about the audience at the East, what it meant to play at the East. And the idea is that when you performed at the East, it was the audience being part of that performance. Unlike downtown, there was no alcohol, there was no smoking. So when you heard people like Charles Mingus in some of his recordings, studio recordings, where he would tell people, you know, to stop the cast registers and, you know, all the other kinds of things that happened, none of those things would take place at the East. And I have to say that some of the most astounding performances that you can imagine took place at Ten Claver Place. When Sonny Rollins came and performed, when he came out on the stage, he received a standing ovation for about almost five minutes. People were yelling and screaming and they were saying, genius, ah, and they were just screaming. And he looked out at that audience and he couldn't believe it. And when the audience sat down, he played like I had never heard him play before. When we talk about the idea of call and response, that's an aspect of what the East was. Ahmed will tell you in terms of playing with Sun Ra. And we didn't have the limitations that the uh, clubs would have. If we started at 10 o'clock, if Sun Ra was going to be performing, it would be sunrise when we went ahead and got out. When, uh, you know, Sun Ra would, would uh, June Tyson would sing, the world is waiting for the sunrise. The sunrise would happen when Sun Ra went ahead and finished that particular set at 10 Clay. So the idea, and, and this is, I think, important. Uh, the last panel I did with Amiri Baraka was a panel at the Vision Festival. You know, um, the last time I, I appeared with him and uh, Baba Amiri is a, a good friend, a mentor, and someone I've appeared with a number of times. We were on a panel that essentially asked the question, where is the black audience for this music? A music that Ahmed Abdullah talks about as being music of the spirit, that uh, Randy Weston talked about his music, 
not as jazz, but as African rhythms. Right. When you talked about what do I, what does he play? If you said, well, you you great jazz player, he said, no, I don't play jazz. I play African rhythm. And the idea that this music is not just jazz and has a specific function in our community, I think is very, very important. The idea that people won't come to see the music is not true. And the East showed that. Not only did the East show that, but out of the East came what is now the International African Arts Festival, which used to be the African Street Carnival, something we started out in the street right in front of Ten Claver Place. And if Sun Ra or Pharaoh would perform at the carnival, which when we first started was free, the community would come out and they would enjoy it. They would have a great time. Folks from the hood would be dancing in the street to the music of Sun Ra. So the idea that somehow there's no audience in our community for this music of the spirit, this spiritual music is not true. Exactly the, right. The and, issue is how do we go ahead and get this music? How do we go ahead and get this music to the community? I think that's the major issue. And that's one that at this time we still have to wrestle with. There used to be, back in the day, there used to be a mechanism of transmission from generation to generation. And we don't really know if that transmission mechanism is still in effect, if it still works in the way that it used to. But it's one that very clearly, if in fact we're going to survive as a people, then one of the things we have to be very, very clear about is that our culture, our music, is an important part of that survival. And there will be attempts for people to gentrify our culture in the same way that they attempt to gentrify our communities. So we have to understand that very clearly, resist it culturally, educationally, politically, if in fact we are to survive. We see today things that are happening in terms of uh, our, our brother, George Floyd, and the names of all of those who have gone on to join the ancestors who were dispatched to that land by the police is something that in some instances we have to say, this music, this culture addresses. Let me end at that. You know, I think I, 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 that's a very, it's a very important point you made about the black audience for the music, because we see over and over again that if you bring the music to the community, the community will come out. We see that all the time. And, uh, you know, the fact that folks may not go downtown for the music is another matter. It may be an economic impediment, a transportation impediment, or whatever. But if you bring the music to the community, the community will come out. No question. The last two posters in my, uh, my slideshow were from 2010. And these were two concerts that we did at Boys and Girls High School, right on Fulton Street in Bed-Stuy. The first one was Doug and Jean Korn. Uh, some of my folks in Atlanta had told me that Doug and Jean Kahn had reunited and that they were actually performing and they performed in Atlanta. When I found this out, I told G2, who was then the founder of the Brooklyn Jazz Consortium, and we decided that we were going to bring Doug and Jean Kahn to Brooklyn. And we did so, the people came out. That was a Kwanzaa show, it snowed heavily the day of the event. And we were like, uh-oh, we don't know if people are gonna be able to get here. The buses were running slow if they ran at all. People came out. The last poster was Pharaoh Sanders and a group of, uh, I guess we have to say Orisha, Yoruba, 
a group called Omiyesa. Uh, we had them at Boys and Girls High School. And we have to say once again, the people responded, they came out. So the idea that people from our community will not support this music is not true. They Absolutely. will. The issue is how do we bring the music to the people? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then uh, from there, I think I'd, I'd love for um, Christina Portrelli to um, introduce her work in relation to um, jazz, linked jazz, and linked open data. Thank you, Abner. Uh, could you let me uh, share the screen because I have a number of, of slides. Yes. Uh, there we go. We went nationally. We were part of something called the Congress of African People. Uh, that was an organization which had branches all around the country and we organized. Some of the things that the Congress of African People has to take credit for is, uh, for instance, uh, Kwanzaa, the dissemination of Kwanzaa around the country. Uh, the only reason why Kwanzaa is known is because of the organizations in the Congress of African People. Uh, Dr. Karenga was actually in jail when Kwanzaa became popular and it was those organizations in the Congress of African People, which made Kwanzaa uh, a very important cultural event uh, available to everybody. Uh, internationally, the African Liberation Support Committee, uh, we essentially at the East uh, became the uh, Northeast representation of the African Liberation Support Committee, a national organization that linked up with liberation movements around the, uh, the world and around Africa to actually go ahead and seek uh, the self-determination of emerging African states and those that were still under colonial rule. Uh, in all of those particular areas, we were effective. Uh, the only thing we can say in terms of the decline of the East is that we, like other uh, active, effective organizations, were attacked by the state. And when that attack came, uh, we were not really in a position to respond um, a as I guess we should have been. You know, we were not prepared. There had been some internal contradictions. And, and because of that, uh, the East did not survive. However, we have to say is that out of the East, there are institutions that still remain. The, as I said earlier, the International African Arts Festival which will celebrate its 50th anniversary next year, comes out of the African Street Carnival, which was first held in front of Ten Claver Place uh, in 1971. So there are elements uh, of the East that, that still remain. Uh, Black Veterans for Social Justice, a uh, social justice organization that looked at veterans and what was taking place in terms of returning veterans, especially those returning from the Vietnam War, uh, that was an organization founded by G2's brother, Job Mashariki. That organization is still uh, active today. So there are numerous elements of the East that, that still exist today. We, we also have a, another question um, for Bashir which is what is, uh, what is the first performance at the East? Um, the, f uh, the first performance, which was uh, New Year's Eve 1969 was Leon Thomas. And uh, the Art Ensemble of Chicago, we never had an opportunity to go ahead and uh, get the Art Ensemble uh, to 10 Clever Place. We would have loved to have done that, but we were not able to do that. Uh, interestingly enough, Baba Randy Weston, who was a great advocate, most of the time that the East was actually functioning, he had his own club in Tangiers, in Morocco. So uh, we, we did not have an opportunity to have Baba Randy as much as we would have liked. He did perform, but uh, he did not perform as much as we would have liked to have had him perform. Yeah, Randy's, Randy's father was a great advocate of the East. In fact, I think it was Randy's father who actually hipped him to the East because as you say, at the time the East was developing, Randy was in Tangier, Morocco. 
and uh, uh, his father actually clued him into the to the development of the East. I want to ask you, Basir, uh, what were the points of contention from, let's say, officialdom, as that that unfortunately led to the demise of the East? Well, um, you know, we always advocated self-determination. And, mm -hmm. and in doing so, uh, you know, we took steps that were contrary to government policy. As an example, uh, if you uh, supported South Africa, if you supported the struggle of uh, the ANC and PAC, mm -hmm. uh, at that particular point, the United States government was calling Nelson Mandela a terrorist and had said that the ANC and PAC were terrorist organizations. Uh, so, you know, we were very contrary to, you know, many things that the government was doing. Um, educationally, you know, we advocated very clearly that we needed to have African-centered education. This is something that today, I mean, if you look at the public school system in New York, it is one of the most backwards, culturally, school systems in the entire country. While in, uh, let's say, New Jersey, you have something called the Amistad Project, which uh, essentially guarantees that the history of African people will be included in the curriculum, uh, despite the fact that there is some legislation that exists in New York State, there's been no such implementation of anything like that in New York City. So the idea that we were you know, working in, in contrary uh, ways in a, a number of different things, the other thing is, I mean, I, I, I have to say, we supported folks who were political prisoners. We supported uh, H. Rap Brown, you know, at that particular point, Imam uh, uh, Jamil, who uh, is a political prisoner. Uh, he was on the run at a particular time. The government has uh, tapes of Asada Shakur being in close proximity to the East. You know, so, uh, you know, there, there are some issues in regards to what we were doing and what the government would have liked us to do. You know, uh, many of us, uh, you know, I, I was, you know, relatively good academically in regards to school. They would have loved for me to be like a, a nice Negro and stuff. But, uh, you know, that was not the case. And to this day, you know, it continues not to be the case. So uh, we were kind of contrarian, we have to say. Um, uh, one question I have and I still continue to think about is, uh, as someone that works as an oral history practitioner, uh, uh, jazz musicians and those that work in jazz um, seem to have like a, a wonderful penchant to like name drop. And what do you think is the nature of either uh, the music or the work that allows for that? And I, I think this is a question for for everyone on the panel, just because some of so you guys have worked closely with the connections and some of you guys have worked with the history and like, or have done the interviews. Well, the nature, the nature of the music is that particularly when musicians are coming up, uh, if they're fortunate, they play with a broad cadre of musicians. They interact with a, a, a broad cadre of musicians uh, in performance. So, you know, you don't have necessarily bands that come up and have 20 and 30 year histories. That, that, that just doesn't happen. So it's just the nature of the music. And then, and then of course you have the old uh, jam session tradition. It's just the nature of the music that jazz musicians, uh, in order to be artistically successful, really have to have a wide, wide network of, of, of contacts and of, 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 of fellow musicians. And so you're going to get that kind of name dropping. And also because of the, 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 the uh, oral tradition nature of jazz music, you know, musicians who are coming up are going to, if they're fortunate and if they're wise, they're going to seek out older musicians to interact with. So then that further develops the network. So yeah, you're right. Jazz musicians do have, a, a, I would say, a wonderful penchant for dropping names. You know, that's why I was interested in that whole linkage process from Pratt. 
because there are so many linkages. I mean, uh, uh, Zakia has taken note of that in some of the interviews that, that, that she's uh, experienced from our oral history project. You know, all these different connections, musicians name dropping, uh, influences, uh, musicians they performed with, and that kind of thing. So you're going to have that phenomenon in jazz. It's the nature of the music. And then um, I guess, uh, Christina, from your side, um, I, what's the more fascinating thing that you've noticed in regards to the connections that you see with the work that you do? But what is interesting for me at this point in time, actually, and I was thinking what I showed was a network of very well-known musicians. So probably for the audience here, nothing new to learn. But what is interesting for me at this point is to use this technique, as I mentioned, as a tool uh, to unearth information, data that is not obvious, that especially musicians who are lesser known. And so the archives, the jazz archives, are full of names of the sidemen uh musicians right. who had incredible legacies and influences they are lost they've been forgotten they didn't become part of the canon of jazz history so i actually would welcome suggestion from you all on how to make this jazz history in uh, i mean buried basically jazz history come to life Maybe, and I was very happy to hear from Wheeler that he thinks that network, the network is a good way of thinking of the jazz community because of this very, very intertwined nature of the relationship, professional and personal. So why they were successful? Because they had these connections, they came also from friendship for solidarity from kind of a, creating a safety, safety net for, for the musicians. And so, yeah, uh, I'm thinking how to, how to make this work uh, really interesting for even, and this is kind of <laughs> too ambitious, but challenging the, the, the current canon. And, and working on Wixville is already, you know, this is already a kind of a platform that brings up to life a, a, a piece of, of, of jazz history that is, is not well known. Well, you know, you saw, we, we, we saw that, that, we saw examples of that, that networking and that connection in, in Basir's uh, slide presentation. Because if you look at some of those slides, you see certain musicians showing up with other people. Uh, you, you see the interactions between musicians just from looking at those flyers. When you see uh, the, the, the side people that the leaders engage in and whatnot, you'd see them elsewhere on the flyers. So you, you see that that whole network is, 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 is very intrinsic to jazz. And, and to this end, actually, we are expanding uh, the type of, of documents that we are going to do the uh, automatic extraction. So flyers programs, uh, this kind of, of documentation that is kind of ephemera somehow would be precious for us. And I was really looking at Mashir actually, mm -hmm. presentation and thinking, wow, this is in itself is a link jazz project that I would love to do because I would personally learn. I mean, I was amazed, I didn't know about the East and now I'm very curious and want to learn more. But it is in itself is, 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 a, is a project that has enormous value. Yeah, let me say one quick thing and that is uh, understanding the need to document so much. Uh, many of us who you know, live through that particular period, we're getting kind of old. And one of the things that I've determined that, you know, I'm going to be yourself. <laughs> <laughs> You're kind of up there. You know, uh, we're going 
going to, I'm going to spend time really beginning to work in terms of archive uh, just yeah, because of the history in terms of all the different kinds of things that I've done. The East, as an example, had a radio program called A View from the East. Uh, G2 where you see gave me the assignment of going ahead and doing that radio program. It was on commercial radio station WLIB. Uh, I interviewed people like Alice Coltrane. I have those tapes. You know, uh, so it's just in terms of so much material. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing a radio program on WBAI for the last 25 years. I've interviewed uh, although when I started the program, it was to deal with education narrowly, I've done it very, very broadly and have interviewed so many musicians that we've talked about today. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. But again, you know, all of this material, uh, to that end, uh, we formed an organization called UPAMA, the Ujima Pan-African Media Archives really, really new organization where we can begin to deal with this question of archival materials and saving those materials. Yeah, I, I, you know, just, just to jump in real quick, you are absolutely right. The importance of archiving these materials is, is, is it, it, it's, I mean, it's everything. You have to archive these materials. Um, I, I have about two, two questions, one from Julia and one from Jermaine. And then afterwards, I know that Ahmed Abdullah and Bob Myers are here. So I'd love to hear a few words from them. Um, but uh, the first question that we have is, um, when thinking of the legacy and also of those organizations founded around the time of the East that have continued to this day, where the local political and educational organizations that had been found in 1920 and 30s. Oh, so basically what um, other political and educational organizations were influenced by the East? Well, I mean, he's, uh, the no. question asked. No, the that's not, no. yeah. It asked the opposite. And yeah. I would yeah. say in terms of the 1920s, the, the best model that we saw was that of Marcus Garvey and the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Um, one of the interesting things, and you know, we, we talk about this, uh, I was part of a panel on May 19th, Brother Malcolm X's birthday. The idea that the civil rights movement in many instances was a rural Christian movement. And in the cities that there were clearly other things that were taking place. Uh, one of the reasons why the Nation of Islam, uh, you know, gained uh, such notoriety so quickly was because that many people in the North were not feeling, <laughs> let us say, the mainstream civil rights movement. So, you know, the idea of, you know, the NAACP, et cetera, you know, while Listen, I got an award from the NAACP last year. So, I mean, I can't diss them, right? But at the same time, uh, politically, you know, that there are some differences. One of the things we've always said is that, you know, we can disagree without being disagreeable and that we can go ahead and have unity without uniformity. So the idea, especially as we see what's taking place uh, around the country right now, is for uh, forming you know, political coalitions, uh, creating situations where people who don't necessarily work together can work together, because that's really important in regards to having the kind of impact uh, that we all need to have on this society currently. Yep. And then the second question before we go to Ahmed and Bob Myers is, um, it's from Jermaine, which is, uh, what advice would you give to people looking to organize during this time? He feels that many people in his generation want to mobilize, but don't know where to start. Um, also, while all this history is amazing. Well, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is that there are a lot of young people, and in some instances, older people, 
who don't really have a history of struggle. My first demonstration was in 1964 in Harlem, what became the Harlem Rebellion. I mean, that's a story in and of itself. Uh, there's a book that came out in 2016 where uh, I and a few other people were interviewed, which talks about that. I was a child, all right? But out of that particular experience, I, I determined that I needed to learn more. One of the things that people who want to be politically involved need to do is they need to read. They need to study. They need to understand movements that have taken place previously. Uh, what were the strengths and weaknesses of those organizations? I talked about the Nation of Islam. What were the weaknesses? What happened in terms of, you know, Brother Malcolm X, who we still lionize, you know, who we idolize at this particular time. There were issues. The East itself, as I talked about, you know, there were issues. We were susceptible to being attacked by the state. So it, it's important that people learn. And, and I, I think one of the things that we have to work better at is intergenerational conversations because the old people are getting older. <laughs> the young people are getting older too, but it's important that uh, we connect intergenerationally more. I know that's one of the things that I'm attempting to try to do more and more uh, through my children, uh, I mean, all different kinds of ways, but it's important, definitely important. Okay, and uh, at this moment, if um, either I met Abdullah or um, Bob Myers have a couple of words that they wanted to share. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just wanted, you know, I, I think this is fantastic. And, and there's so much rich history in Brooklyn that um, to be able to document it and to have it archived in this way and to have the link ups, I think it's, it's a fascinating and important thing. Uh, and I just wanted to add a couple of things, a couple of notes as I was thinking. Um, one is that Leon Thomas both uh, was the first person to perform at the East and at Sisters Place. Uh, and the East and Sisters Place are like within two blocks of each other right. you know, on, um, on Jefferson Avenue. Mm -hmm. right? um, the other thing I wanted to, uh, to say that even before the East, there was a place called 1310 Atlantic Avenue, which was the New Directions Daycare Center. Uh, talking about dropping names, I was studying with Cal Massey at the time, and he created one of the most fantastic benefits ever known for the Black Panther Party in 1969 uh, at 1310 Atlantic Avenue. The, the, uh, there's a flyer that's circulating somewhere around it, uh, uh, around uh, about it, but people like Freddie Hubbard and Betty Carter and Lee Morgan and uh, a host of uh, different people uh, performed at this for the Black Panther Party. Very, very little known history of, uh, of Brooklyn. The, um, the daycare center was about giving people uh, a leg up as far as the system was concerned. You know, we were, you know, really, I was teaching there at at 20 years old, right? 20, 21 years old, right? We were trying to uh, give kids, you know, a head start. And we were teaching them about black culture, you know, before they went into the public school system. So we had kids from three months, right up into like four years old. And we were working with them there, you know? Uh, and, it, and it existed for at least three years, uh, you know, up until about 19, 72 the um the the uh gig that we did the uh the benefit that we did for the black panther party uh was such that the uh we were getting ten thousand dollars a month from uh, a private donor and when we did the gig for the black panther party uh they made sure that we didn't get ten thousand dollars a month anymore so the next benefit that cal massey did was a benefit for the new directions daycare center and we did that in Staten Island, and he had this the same cast of of thousands that he would he would uh, he would have on his uh, his benefits. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to, uh, to say was that the uh, original people within the CBJC, and Bob Myers could probably um, verify this, were Tory McCartney, Al McCarroll, and Viola Plummer. They were the original people, and they decided to bring in uh, G2YUC because he had the name and clout, the recognition uh, to be able to lead the organization. But because um, Tory McCartney was a Jazz 966, which is a very important institution that is still going on, and Viola Plummer was at Sister's Place, they came together with the idea, Alma Carroll was the wife of Joe Carroll. She had a, an interest in making sure people knew who Joe Carroll was, they came, these three sisters came together to uh, originally create the Central Brooklyn Jazz Consortium. So I just wanted to, you know, one of the things about history is that we want it always to be factual. Yeah, well, man, I don't know if I'm on. You are. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, this is Bob Myers. I I guess my segue would be, you know, starting with Leon Thomas. I heard, you know, Leon started at the East. He came to Sister's Place, but I used to run a place called the Up Over Jazz Cafe, and that was Leon Thomas's last performance. I wasn't even going to mention that, but that Friday night before he went to the Lincoln Hospital, Brother Leon Thomas came over the Up Over. So that's just one point of note. And uh, thank you for um, clarifying things I made about CBJC. Those three women founded CBJC, and that's correct. And G2 became our chairman because they figured nobody would mess with us if we had G2 here in Brooklyn at Control. And I came on in 1999, and I was recruited by Tory at the Up Over Jazz Cafe. But I want to bring up a point. Barcia mentioned, you know, the black audience for jazz. And you hear a lot of papers about where black people are jazz clubs. You can go to the Blue Note, the Vanguard, and you don't see, you know, maybe 10, 15 percent of the audience might be African American. But the the connection between the music and the black church. I'm noticing a lot more these jazz vespers coming up. And the black church is becoming more interested in the name jazz, whereas before the name jazz was taboo almost in the black church. Now with uh, these pastors such as Gary Simpson and this, that want to host jazz events such as the Brooklyn Jazz Hall of Fame to honor Max Roach there at uh, here in Brooklyn as we go ahead with our own archival of these jazz shrines through the Brooklyn Jazz Hall of Fame. So making the connection with the Black church is opening up the audiences that were African Americans. I want to bring that up, how to do that. And for Christina, she said bringing her project to life. It would be great, Christina, if the addresses where a lot of these musicians lived here in Brooklyn. Some were born. And we at the Brooklyn Jazz Hall of Fame are trying to find out where these people live. We are going to rename Max Rocha Street if things come off with this pandemic in September. So the politicians have that set up for the third week of September. But as we bring it to life, when people see that Lena Horn was born here, Freddie Hubbard lived here, and such and such. So maybe that could be something to be thought about. The address is a sort of map of where these people live. So those, just those two comments. And, and I'd like to thank Obden, you know, what Weeksville is doing with this, this whole thing, bringing this technology one thing we're thinking about Central Brooklyn Jazz Consortium, how do we move forward? Because it's, you know, most of the venues in Brooklyn are venues that, you know, have um, occupancy issues, you know, and we have 75 or less can come in. Now that we have to cut that into 50%, it's going to be more difficult to have money to pay musicians to perform at our venues. So technology, access to the technology for the venues, 
and being able to charge for these virtual concerts and get support worldwide for some of these musicians would be a big boost to the economy of central Brooklyn and the entertainment clubs. So just put those three points out, but the black church, the addresses of musicians and giving the clubs, the venues, giving them access to technology to put on concerts. Well, thank you. You know, another, another Brooklyn institution that I don't want us to lose sight of that I failed to mention in my, in my earlier comments that uh, should be added to that list of important Brooklyn uh, socio-cultural institutions would be the new muse. Mm. And one of the people that, 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 that we interviewed on our oral history project was uh, the great bassist, NEA Jazz Master Reggie Workman. Uh, who, who, who ran that for a time. So uh, I, I hope that Zakia and other folks who are continuing this project will certainly include the new muse in their considerations. Yes, I just wanted to respond to both Willard and uh, Bob Myers. Um, actually in the oral histories we have so many addresses and many of the oral histories either took place in the homes of uh, the interviewees and they also mentioned the place where they grew up um, and the homes that they grew up and the addresses of many of these venues that have now become different places um, and so something that we've like tossed around in the past it's like sort of a walking tour with these addresses um, so people can sort of like either follow along on an app or on Google or whatever the technology is and be able to learn more about these places um, and maybe even sort of work with you all in renaming streets after some of these uh, jazz musicians that are from Brooklyn. Um, so I think there's so this project of the, the Lost Jazz Shrines oral history is so rich that it like has enough information for this project and a hundred other projects. Um, and then also churches are also mentioned in that collection as well. Um, it wasn't a part of this project, but it's definitely another data point that can be explored later. Um, so again, it's like such a rich collection um, and I'm about to link to uh, the oral history page in the chat um, and the full oral histories aren't there. Um, but you can always email us and we could send you a copy um, or they will eventually be uploaded to the website. So um, I'm going to just link where you can hear some snippets um, and read uh, the uh, summaries of the transcripts that we have online. If I can add just quickly uh, about the addresses, I'm, I'm so happy that Bob mentioned the, the an interest in having uh, the residences of, of the musicians geomapped because something we did, it was a small pilot, actually Sarah did it, um, with uh, musicians from the union uh, membership directory uh, in New Orleans local for 96. So we had this directory of the union and there were all the residences of the musicians. So we were able to um, map their homes uh, against the historic districts of, of New Orleans in the 40s. So I, I wonder where we could find all the addresses systematically. Certainly the oral histories would be a good source, but maybe there are other documents that would give us automatically all the residencies. But anyway, it's, 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 it's very interesting and, and, and the possibility of, of mapping, it, it's, it's open to so many layers and, and, and so that's, that's, that's wonderful to think about and then to start collecting data. And um, I think on that note, um, I would like to, again, thank all the panelists for taking out the time to speak today. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone um, who came out and uh, my apologies for the very rough beginning that we had. 
Um, but uh, I hope that we were able to get a lot of information from this session and um, I hope everyone stays safe and like continues listening to some of their favorite albums and that they're from um, yeah. Central Brooklyn as we learned of its rich legacy. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention is that uh, our programming in regards to um, the linking Lost Jazz Shrines will continue throughout the month of June. Um, as Moshe Burnett will do a second um, streaming session of records on the 17th. And then on the 20th, um, the wonderful team of Zakia and Sarah will do a workshop on link open data, which uh, I think is really helpful in bridging the gaps or making like these very strong connections um, through oral history or any other project that you have that has a, a metadata component. And then um, on the 27th, we will have um, Bob Myers, Raz Monte Burnett, and uh, Anika Paris in conversation on um, curation and basically the love of jazz. So basically people just riffing um, about the music itself and like how they got into it and like the things that they listen to on a regular basis and why. But again, thank you again for uh, coming out. Uh, may you have a wonderful night. And I um, uh, hope to see you guys, everyone, again. Um, OK, I've uh, been great. Yeah. All right, peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Okay. Thanks for moderating, Bye. Austin. OK. Thanks, yeah, no problem. <laughs> oh, hey, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, hard to say goodbye. <laughs> It is, bro. Especially with this discussion. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Well, um, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, Roz, um, about moving forward. I didn't hear you, bro. I'll, I'll, I'll send you some text moving forward. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you for everything. Oh, yeah. No problem. Okay. <laughs>